morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad that we can gather together this morning to worship. We pray that uh, you will be blessed by being here this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 John, the 5th chapter, verses 4 and 5. This is what it says. For whoever, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for... The opportunity we have to gather together this morning to praise and to worship. We thank you that we have this place where we can come and share together. We pray for your presence in our midst this morning, Father. We pray that all that we say and do this day will bring glory and honor to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
communion this morning. I thought I'd share a few thoughts. In case you haven't guessed, the theme of the service this morning is overcoming faith. And I don't think that there's any place better to think about the overcoming faith that we receive or have than when we come to the communion table. I say it a lot, but it is true. This is the most important time of our morning. It is the most important time when the body of Christ comes together and then comes to the Lord's table because the Lord is here. Baseball season started this week. And as they began the season, there were demonstrations of solidarity and, and the baseball players knelt at the beginning of the ball games. With one lone exception, when the Giants were playing the Dodgers. And they talked to that young man after the ball game. And he made a very profound statement. He said, I'm not against demonstrating. I'm not against the issues that are out there. But he says, I'm a Christian. And I only bow a knee to my Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the communion table reminds us of whose we are. We belong to God. That's the relationship that has been established for us on the cross. Jesus died so that you and I could be called sons of God. And we could call upon the Lord as our Savior. And we need to, to remind ourselves that if we're going to bow in front of anyone, it's going to be Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Until that time comes, you and I have a responsibility to share our faith. And whether we remember it or not, every time we come to this table and every time we partake of the emblems, to anyone that witnesses what we are doing, we are saying, I belong to God. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. We're going to play a very familiar hymn this morning as a way to give you time to meditate. Take whatever time you need when you're ready. Go get your emblems and come back and partake as you feel led in partaking. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We are so grateful for what we remember as we come to this table. We remember that you love us. We remember that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And because he died, he paid the penalty. And because he rose again, we live in overwhelming victory. Help us to remember that every time we come to your table. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged Jesus. All of us 
then who are mature should take such a view of things, and in, if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. I think Paul is reminding us here that we need to be resilient. And I think being resilient is probably an important character trait, and I think we can, in, in our lives, we can develop being resilient. We can do it in the church, and we can do it as individual Christians. You know, in all walks of life, sports, science, education, government, you pick a field, it doesn't make any difference. Those who stand out are those who have found a way to overcome challenge. The Bible gives us example after example of men and women who overcame challenges in their lives. The Old Testament speaks about a man named Caleb. 85 years old was presented with a challenge. Listen to how he responded to that challenge in Joshua, the 14th chapter, verses 10 and 11. Caleb says, Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. Since the time he said to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to the battle now as then. And then he told Joshua, give me this mountain. Because he had faith he could overcome. Daniel. Daniel would pray to his God three times a day. Even after it became against the law to pray. Noah didn't let hardship and the fact that it had never rained keep him from building a boat. God said, build me an ark, and Noah built him an ark. He had faith that allowed him to overcome what his eyes were seeing. Moses had the joy of leading the most stiff-necked people on the face of the planet. For years and years and years, he led them through hardship after hardship, and he continued to call upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord continued to hear his prayer and answer and deliver. Mary, teenage girl, virgin girl, betrothed to Joseph, was told she was going to be the mother of the Son of God. She didn't understand most of it. But she had faith and declared that she was the Lord's handmaid. Peter, as fallible and foilable as any man on this planet, would overcome failings, faults, and have an overwhelming faith that would help to, to found and lead the church. So I believe that it is possible for all of us here to possess that kind of faith. A faith that cannot be defeated even when we fail and fall short. We're going to use Paul this morning to give us some examples of things that we can do so that we can have overcoming faith. First, we can be strengthened in our relationships. Paul's ministry was full of connections with others as he served. His letters are filled with personal references, personal notes, personal remembrances of individuals and churches that held special places in his heart. His missionary journeys were never a one-man show. He took Barnabas. He took 
Silas. He took Timothy. He took John Mark. He had people go with him and help him do the work. And as he talked about one another in his letters, he was emphasizing just how important it is to be connected to each other. To serve. To forgive. To motivate. To encourage. To submit to. And to love one another. One of the sources of strength that I have seen during this crisis was the power of relationships. I've seen it exhibited in this body. We've checked on one another. We've served one another. That's faith in action. Secondly, we need to choose meaningful goals. One of the things that has always been true of Paul, he always had a goal in front of him. A purpose in his life. Something that he worked toward. Now there was a point in Paul's life where he had the wrong goal in front of him. We need to make sure that we are choosing meaningful goals and then working toward them. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 11, Paul says, And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands just as you're told. I need to read that verse of Scripture every day. Every day. Mind my own business, keep to myself, work with my hands. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 9, Paul says, So we make it our goal to please Him, God, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Choose meaningful goals. Verse 14 of the text said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Finding goals in our relationship with Christ allows us to lift our eyes off of our problems and struggles and focus on the future with a meaning and a purpose. It does mean that we need to be proactive. That we need to figure out what needs to be done. We need to take, make a plan and then we need to take action. We need to be making good choices. Third, we need to remember where we've been. Paul often reflected on the past. When he interacted with the churches, when he wrote those letters, he often reflected on his past and where he had been and where he had come but he never longed to go back to that. He would reflect on it because he had learned something from it. He wanted to remember where God had carried him through and where he was now. In 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 8 and 9, he says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. One of the tools at our disposal for building and overcoming faith in our own lives is our ability to remember all that we have experienced and come through with God's help. Each one of us can look back at the mess that we have made and see how God cleaned it up for us. That's a great learning tool. A great learning tool. And we need to use it. The fourth thing that I want to remind us of, we need to remember the hope that is ours. You know, where Paul was concerned, it just didn't matter 
to him what his circumstances were. He had the ability to focus on the hope that was his in his relationship with God through Christ Jesus. He constantly focused on that hope. On the promise that had been made to him and made to every believer. In Romans, the 15th chapter, verse 13, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we can get too focused on the news, the noise, the struggles, the opinions that are going on in our country and around the world. And if we forget, we have been given a great hope. And that hope is not found here. That hope is found in Christ Jesus and it's somewhere else. Listen to what Peter says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you through who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The final thing is we need to feed our faith. We need to feed our faith. Now when I look around, we don't have a problem feeding ourselves. I'm a perfect example of that. But how do we feed our faith? Because that's something that we need to do. We need to feed our faith so that we will continue to grow. Paul always attributed his strength and all that was valuable about his life to Jesus Christ. And I certainly think that that's a great place to start. But there are a lot of things that we can do that we have direct control over that can feed our faith. I've listed a few of those. Pray. Study the Word. Worship. Individually, corporately. Share in fellowship. Serve. We can all do those things. It takes no special talent for every person in this room to do those things. And that's certainly not a complete list. But it's a list that we can share. And it encompasses many of the teachings of the New Testament. And that was shown to us through Jesus Christ. Paul's faith had grown to the point where as he was in prison awaiting sentencing and death he could declare this in Philippians the fourth chapter. In Philippians 4 verses 12 and 13 he says I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things, all this, through Him who gives me strength. I believe that Paul shows us an example of overcoming faith. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful. Grateful for the faith that is ours. A faith that can be built and made strong. 
a faith that can sustain no matter the situation. Father, help us to do all in our power to have an overwhelming faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Helen Keller once said, Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. The good news for the Christian the good news for the church is we've been promised that we will overcome. And we'll overcome because Christ has already overcome. John 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Christians in the church need to be reminded that we already possess this overcoming faith. We need to do what we can to feed it, to nurture it, to help it grow. To those who do not know Jesus, the perfect place to begin is in a relationship with Him. The Bible says that if you believe He is God's Son, that He died on the cross for your sins and rose on the third day, if you will repent, confess, be buried in the waters of baptism, your sins will be forgiven, you'll be given His Holy Spirit, and your faith begins to grow. If that's something you need, you come as we stand and sing.